seen. So um, I'm just going to start by saying, have any of you been told that your school days are going to be the best days of your life? Yeah, a couple of nods, yeah. So have you ever been told that your school days, uh, once they're gone, you'll never get them back? Yeah, yeah. Now, one of those things is true. You won't get them back. Like, just as today is gone, tomorrow, you'll never get it back. But that doesn't mean to say that everybody's school days are the best days of their life. Mine certainly weren't. 1998, I was a pupil here. And you can see by how old it is, how old the photo is, that um, the uniform is completely different. Uh, so I just want a quick tally. Um, hands up if you like your uniform better than mine. Yeah, I kind of would as well. Yeah, so I'm kind of, I feel a bit bummed that I haven't got your uniform, but anyway, uh, what's, that's fine. So, leaving day 1998, I had lots of friends. I had lots of people who knew me. I had lots of people who respected me. Um, the one different thing was I was a bit weird. I stood out from everybody else in my year group. I stood out from my closest friends who were with me in that picture. And I stood out because of this. Peter Andre fans. Oh, that's good. Uh, that's good in my way. Um, anyone who knows who Peter Andre is? Yeah? Um, anyone who Meatloaf is? Yeah? So, when all my friends were at school, they were um, singing the words along to Mysterious Girl. I, on the other hand, was singing the words to Bat Out of Hell. I actually loved Meatloaf so much that I wanted him to be my dad. I actually pretended that he was my dad, and some, no one believed me, obviously. Um, also, I dressed differently from everybody else. I didn't want to wear the same clothes as everybody else, so on all clothes day, it was always a nightmare because I always had something strange on. I always had a t-shirt with a, a band member from a, a band that nobody had ever heard of, whereas all my, my friends were dressed in like um, really fashionable tracksuits and stuff. Um, I wore things like this, like dungarees. Now, whatever you say these days, like fashion, I think, has come a whole different way this was never fashionable. It will never be fashionable because of how I wore it. So, my um, career goal in life was to be a gurner. And this is gurning. And I thought that I could make a lot of money from doing this. Now, there are actually competitions across the world where people go collate and they, they do this and they raise lots of money and they win lots of money. Um, and I would sit in front of the mirror and I would do this and my mum would say, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm practicing. I'm going to be, I'm going to pull faces. Um, obviously, I didn't do that because of what actually didn't make sense to me then was to be successful at this, you had to have no teeth. And I had a full set, so it wasn't really going to go my way. Brownies, any brownies? Cubs or scouts? Mm -hmm. A couple maybe. Um, I was a brownie and I took my role as a brownie very literally. As a brownie you're told that you have to help other people, you have to make a difference in life. And from the age of 10 I took that seriously. So I wanted to know why the Queen wasn't getting rid of, um, wasn't helping the people who were homeless and on the streets. I wanted to know why she was not giving any of her money to rehouse them or help the people who were starving across the world. So my said to me, Oh, I can ask her, aren't you right to her? So I did. Now, I want to do a quick tally again. How many people think I got a, a reply? Okay, I want to do how many people think I didn't get a reply? Okay, so I got a reply. Um, but you weren't accepting that one. I got a reply from the lady in waiting. So it wasn't quite the Queen, but it was a lady in waiting. She was at Buckingham Palace. And she said that the Queen was very busy and that she didn't have time to write back to me. But the best advice that they could give me was to um, go and work in Oxfam, go and work in a charity shop, go and help people who need, who need that help, and that was the best way to do it. Oh, it's 10 years old. So anybody got, so how old are we in the room now? Are we 13, 14? Cool. Um, so even now, you'd be too young to technically get a job. You'd be, you'd be too young to get a side job. So at the age of 10, I was even younger, so that wasn't gonna happen, it wasn't gonna work. But I made a decision instead. I made a decision to dream big. I was creative at school. I was imaginative. I was thoughtful. And 
I decided that I was going to write stories and screenplays, poetry. I was never any good at poetry, it didn't last very long at all. Um, and I was going to do all of those things. And I was going to be just like the writers you see above there, Stephen King, Edie Blyton, Shakespeare. Um, and I was going to, I was going to do that. I was going to, make, I was going to have all my books made into blockbusting films, which I would then win a BAFTA or an Oscar, and also get to wear a pretty dress on the red carpet. Obviously, that hasn't happened. If it had happened, probably wouldn't be stood here now um, in a cheap dress from um, H&M. Anyway, I instead. Decided to do this. Why did I decide? I got depression. Now, I'm a quick. How many people know what depression is? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. There's quite a few. So you'll know that every single person has a different experience of depression. Every single person has a different feeling, and not, not, their symptoms are very different from one person to another. My depression was very much the same. I had something that I, I couldn't relate to other people with. And I experienced depression at school. Now, I was also bullied at school. I was bullied for being a swat. I was bullied because I had glasses. I was bullied because I didn't wear the right clothes. I didn't do the right things. I didn't like the right music. So that made it worse. So I grew up thinking that um, being bullied for those reasons was what the problem was. But actually, it was a lot more to do with that. It was a lot more than what was happening at school, and it was a lot more than what was happening at home. To channel my depression, the best thing, the only thing that I could think of to do was to write stories. I wrote my first novel when I was 11. I wrote College Fears. And it was about a girl who was at college who was starving herself because she was unhappy. But there was no reason for her to be unhappy. She was just starving herself because she didn't want to be here. At 13, I wrote this one, Waste of a Person. And that was about a girl who was 18 and she was obsessed with suicide. And she tried to kill herself 13 times in five years. Now, people thought I was a bit miserable. They thought I was very morbid and I was writing about things that people didn't really need to know. Why was I writing things about suicide and self-harm and starving yourself? That was, the only, that was the only way I could channel what I was feeling inside. I couldn't do anything on the outside. I couldn't voice it. So that was how I did it. I was a bit shy. Maybe that's why because I used to write everything down. I never really had a voice to say anything. Um, but the biggest thing was I was never allowed to be who I was. My friends didn't let me be who I was. I wasn't able to be my, myself with my family. I felt outside the circle all the time. Maybe if I'd been, a bit, been able to be who I wanted to be and who I, who I might enjoy being, my life would be different. I would have been happier. I would have been more accepted. But this family, happy families, appearances can be deceptive. Sometimes, what people see is not really what's there. And this particular occasion was my grandparents' wedding anniversary and they came over to the house. My mum made him a cake and we had a barbecue and we played in the garden and my dad took this picture and he put the camera, really old camera, you know, the ones that you had filming it and everything. Put the camera on the fence and then he tied it, ran back to the picture and that's what we got. Now this is the only picture I can find with us all together. So you'll see me in the corner, just my head. Um, so that was, that was that picture. What that picture doesn't tell you is that my, my dad hated me, he hated my brother, I don't think he liked my mum very much, and he would run the house like a military camp. We had bedroom inspections, we had degree level maths lessons on a Saturday afternoon, we had been given an, an allocated time to eat a meal. We, We'd be given our meal, and we had to wait for him to see if she could eat. And quite often he would eat his meal and leave the room and we'd still be waiting to see whether we could eat ours or not. He was emotionally abusive, he called us names, he played us off against each other, and the house was always much happier when he wasn't in it. And those were the times, when he wasn't in it, those were the times that I actually really enjoyed. 
my big goal was to get away from this. I didn't want to get away from my grandparents. I didn't want to get away from my mum. I didn't want to get away from my brother. I wanted to get away from my dad. The only, thing, the only way I could do that, I could think of doing that, was working as hard as I possibly could at school to get the best grades I could at school to go to university. That's what I needed. That's what I did. Again, I got bullied because I was a swap. Well, that was my reason why. And I managed it. I went to, I went to university. However, what I realised quite quickly was you can change your surroundings. You can change the people that you're with. You can change your dress, you can change your music taste, you can change anything you want, but at the end of the day, people are the same. They're the same kinds of people everywhere. And I'm, my, I'm including myself in that. I was the same. I moved from, from Bolton to York, but I was still the same person. I still didn't fit in every, anywhere. I didn't fit in with my friends. I didn't fit in with, with people on my course. I didn't fit in with anybody. I was still weird. And then I was in my third year at university when this came back. I woke up one day and I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't think properly, I didn't know what to do. And I ended up leaving university. I left uni about three months before I was due to finish. I'd almost finished the university and then but I had to come out because I couldn't I couldn't cope anymore. Went to the GP, they gave me medication, give me antidepressants, and they worked for a time, they worked a little bit, but then that happened. And mania, for me, is having strange ideas, things happen that were different. I would see things, I'd hear things, I'd smell things, and everything around me that wasn't there, I was experiencing, but couldn't understand why anybody else wasn't. And then I got a diagnosis. Bipolar affective disorder. Has anybody heard of bipolar? Yes, well, it's quite a few. So you'll know. So, so for the ones who don't know, bipolar disorder is a severe mental health condition where you experience extreme highs and extreme lows. I always find that it's really hard to explain what it is because no two people are the same. No one's going to experience the same symptoms as another person. I've got quite a few friends with the same diagnosis, but they don't have the same symptoms that I would and I do have. So everyone is different. Now for me, I ended up in hospital. I ended up almost sectioned and it was the worst thing because I ended up on a, on a Bolton psychiatric ward. I'd never been introduced to a psychiatric ward before. I'd never known what was happening. No one ever tells you what, what's, what happens on a psychi psychiatric ward. No one tells you when your meal's are, no one tells you when you, you can have a cup of tea. You're on the locked ward, they shut the door behind you, and you can't get in all right because you are deemed not to be physically able to do that. It's a bit like being in a prison, only you really haven't done anything wrong. The fact is you're just very poorly. I had a social worker given to me on the day of discharge, and the social worker said to me, have you got any questions? So I said, when can I go back to university? She went, oh no. Don't think about university now. You've got a very serious mental health condition. So I thought, well, all those years of working towards it, what good is that now? I have to do something. I can't, I can't sit on my bum all day. I need to do something. So what if I get a job? She said, no, 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 no. You don't need a job. You've got a very serious mental health condition, so there are all sorts of benefits available to you. And that kind of put into perspective that I wasn't the same as anybody else anymore. I was literally labelled and I was given a label that meant that I wasn't as good as another person. And then this question came to mind. Will I ever get a boyfriend? Will anybody ever want me enough to take my bipolar disorder on? Will anybody like me for who I am? And she basically said this. You have mental illness, so you'll find having a relationship extremely difficult, if not impossible. That broke my heart because I was 22 and I'd been told that every single thing a normal person can do was out of bounds for me. Every single thing that a normal person can achieve, can aspire to, is told that they can have, is now normal. 
not allowed for me because I have that label, I have that bipolar label. So I knew I had to prove it wrong. I had to prove to the social workers, I had to prove to the doctors. I even had to prove to some members of my family that despite having a mental illness, despite having bipolar disorder, despite all of those things, I hadn't given up on me. Because at the end of the day, it was me that was living my life. It was nobody else. I still had to go on in this world. So, I took any job I could possibly get. Have you got any Cars Pasty fans? Yeah, so I worked for, for them since I was 16. Um, and they, I, used to, I used to ring up the manager and say, can I have a job? And he'd go, yeah, come and have three shifts a week or something. So he did that. Um, anybody like Milky Bars? Milky Bars? Okay, so only a few of you, that's good, because the rest of you are never going to experience the fact that what they do in the Nestle factory is if the tank bursts with the chocolate, the white chocolate, they just scoop it up and put it back in the tank. They don't put it in the bin, they don't like to waste it. So anybody who eats a milky bag, just think that your milky bag might have been on the floor. Uh, anybody like Subway? Yeah, but it's, it's all, you always get the highest number of people for Subway, and the annoying thing is I haven't got a story for you for Subway. So that's just enjoy it some way. Uh, story doesn't end there. I could end it there. I said it's quite good, but the job. Um, and the truth is, I actually went back to university. I finished finished my degree. Um, it took me six years to do it. To do a three-year course, it took me six years. And things were going really well. I had, I had a job after that. I ended up at SDA Travel in the admin department. I've been there nine years full time, so I'll, I beat that statistic as well. But it doesn't end there. In my quest to have a normal life, I didn't take responsibility for my illness. I didn't accept the fact that I had bipolar disorder. I didn't accept that I had that condition that would rule my life. So in doing that, I made the condition worse. And in 2011, I had my worst period of mania today. I, I believed that I could save the world. I believed that I had the powers to save every single human being, every single person in the, in the building, in the world. I could take them to safety because the world was going to end and it was up to me to stop them. It sounds battered, doesn't it? Yeah. So I ended up back in the hospital. And then the night before my first re review with the doctor, he said to me, what are you thinking? So I wrote an eight page booklet on what I was going to do to save the world. And I wrote about the um, NHS, the education system, the prison system. I wrote about everything, treatment of the elderly. If you ask me a question, I had it all covered, all covered. I could answer anything or question you like, you ask me. But my psychiatrist said to me, what if it isn't possible? What if you're just ill? And I thought to myself, wow. If all I'm trying to dream of, if everything that I spent six hours yesterday writing this, this, this booklet on isn't real, then what's the point? That's no way for a person to live. And he said, I will get you the life you want and the life you deserve. And I thought, at the time, well, that's lovely. That's really nice of him. That's a very nice thing to say. But my life was in his hands. He was reading an eight-page document that I'd written. And I, that was what I wanted. I wanted to save the world. I didn't realise that... I was actually really ill, and actually I was giving in to the, the symptoms of my illness. I was doing something that wasn't that I, try, I tried to fight against for so long. And then he said this, you have to learn about your illness cap, so that you can take control of it, rather than it taking control of you. And now I adapt that to any problem that I have in life, and I, I, I always say that to people that have a problem in life, that you can, you can take control of a situation, no matter what it is, in some capacity you can take control of that situation and you can make it part of what you, you are controlling, rather than it being in charge of you. So I have house rules now, and I'm a little bit boring, this might look really boring, but I live by these. I get as much regular sleep as possible, because um, with bipolar, if sleep is affected, then you can end up with a high or a low. I also don't use a computer after 9pm, simply because I use one every day at work for eight and a half hours and to 
do the same thing at home, it can crash your brain. So I'll let my, my brain relax. I also, now this is the third one is not for everybody. Don't read the newspapers and I don't watch the news. That's not because I don't want to, it's because I can't. If I see something on the news that affects me, good or bad, then I then automatically within minutes that one trigger is set off in my brain that I can help that situation, that I can save the world. With or without medication, that's still something in my brain that is my bipolar disorder to take control of me again. So, I, so to avoid that, I don't watch the news. I always live by this now. So I was weird at school. I liked meatloaf. I dressed weird. Well, I'm just as weird now. I'm 36 years old. I'm just as weird. I like swans. I like drag queens. Does anyone know what a drag queen is? Yeah, cool. Uh, that's great. So I, I love drag queens. And um, I like Cher. Any Cher fans? One. We've got one. Oh, no, we've got a couple. Brilliant. That was great. So love Cher. Um, and against all odds, like I said, I finished my degree. That's kind of cool. And I also bought a house. Now, the social worker said to me that I would never, leave, I would never live independently from my mum. I would always be cared for by my mum as a carer. So when I bought a house, I didn't want to buy it on my own. I bought it with this guy, and I got married. So having a relationship wasn't that difficult once I found him. Um, that, that picture actually wasn't paused for either, so I was like, oh, I love that picture. And um, he, he's just as weird as I am. Um, he's not got bipolar or anything, but he is just as strange as I am. He likes weird things. We both like weird things. We like a pair of children. Um, but he accepts it for everything in my life that I have, I've ever done and ever, I ever will do. Um, and it's kind of nice to have that full spark from someone. So in 2015 I decided to do this. I was kind of tired of not doing anything or just kind of going through life and not thinking, not being active. So I decided to join a public speaking group. And I did. The only trouble was I didn't fit in again. So I joined another one didn't fit in there either, so I ended up having to do most of my speaking, learning how to do it by myself. But I also was taught by the guy in the middle, Richard McCann, I spoke to him yesterday. He actually spoke here probably about 15 years ago. What one was it? Helen? Oh, yeah. She's supposed to know, but she doesn't know. So yes, yeah, so he actually spoke here, and I'm kind of following in his footsteps. Um, and he's got quite an amazing story, and he's showed me how to deliver mine. I'm also the Employment Ambassador for Bipolar UK and um, with them I got the chance to go to Coronation Street. Does anybody have know of the character in Coronation Street who has bipolar disorder? No? Not even one? Okay. Well, there, oh there we go, one. Yeah, Gina. Yeah. yeah? Um, so I got to meet her and I told her what bipolar was like and I told her what depression was like and I told her how it affects the individual all the way through the life. Um, I also am the ambassador for our local men mental health charity band in Thailand, the YMCA. They gave me so many opportunities. They've given me the main stage at their mental health awareness days every single year for the last three years. Um, so what I do more or less it's the same thing. Um, don't normally show this slide, and I promise that I won't, I won't show it more than three times a day, that's it. But I never get to say thank you to my mum. She's uh, my travel buddy. She looks after me. She even lives two doors down from me. Um, and I'm sure she gets kind of sick of me as well, but she's supported me through absolutely everything. And I, I wouldn't be the person or who I am today without her and without my husband as well. So, final bit, nearly almost there. I've learned two lessons, probably in the last few months, that having People believe in you is wonderful. It's great. I had people believe in me all the way through school. What I didn't have was belief in myself. So having that belief in yourself is what makes you the best, the best person you can possibly be. Because you, each person in this room has the ability to do something incredible, and it's down to you to decide what that incredible thing is. It doesn't have to be saving the world. It doesn't have to be removing the home with people. It can just be just helping some, opening the door for someone. But each person can do something good and you can make themselves feel good and to have that belief that you can get through any kind of hardship is where you'll find the most peace. So finally, 
I've learnt that life doesn't have to end because we have a mental illness. Life doesn't end because of the hardships that we go through. But life does start when you make the best of a bad situation and take control of it. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, I know it's been uh, a long term, but I can only just...